I am a councilwoman for the third ward of the Wheeling City Council, and I am the associate director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Being the first out transgender elected official in West Virginia is a fascinating experience. I didn't run to make history. You know, I, I ran to make a difference in my community. I grew up in East Liverpool, Ohio. We were a really humble um, family. You know, my parents are both blue collar workers. My, my father worked in our local factory. I believe it has shaped the way I view, you know, uh, my community and my leadership. My family and myself, we had never heard of the word transgender. We had never heard of transgender people when I was a kid. In the early 2000s, there were very few representations of trans people. There were um, virtually no discussions about how we help include trans people in conversations about justice and representation. So for my parents, I think that they, they acknowledged really early on that I was different. And yet, bless their heart, it didn't go away. And they had to, you know, kind of um, take it more seriously as I grew up because the, you know, my, my own gender expression became more intense and, you know, so many trans folks and LGBT people hear the phrase, it's just a phase. And my parents, you know, that was their tagline for a long time. It wasn't until I was around 11 or 12 that, you know, my parents put me into therapy. That was the moment that uh, our therapist gave us the word transgender. And for me, it was kind of a light bulb moment and, and kind of liberating because I didn't have the word either. I could describe what it felt, but we didn't have we didn't have the language. And I think for my parents too, it was both liberating and frightening. I think that they they knew that if they led with love and that they supported their kid, that it would work out. And you know, I'm forever grateful to them for their support because you know that makes the difference in the life of of a trans person is the you know the support in their home in their community. I, I will forever be indebted to them. I don't know a trans person who hasn't come across, you know, serious obstacles or discrimination or bias. And, you know, while I try to stay positive and I really don't focus on, you know, some of the negative things, they're out there. They exist. This past Pride Month was perhaps the most convoluted Pride Month I've ever been a part of in the best and the worst ways. You know, during Pride Month, we had um, a landmark, unbelievable decision by the Supreme Court to protect LGBTQ folks in the workplace. But in the same breath, you know, we had the Trump administration roll back transgender health care protections. So it is a very strange time to be a trans person and to be a vulnerable um, uh, person in America. It might sound counter to everything that's going on, but I do feel hopeful. I, I see that folks in some of the most traumatic times that I can remember, you know, in American history, you know, people are really coming out and standing up and speaking out about injustice, about poor leadership, uh, and about what they want uh, to see uh, their country become. One of the reasons I ran for office is so that I could um, not just, you know, stand on a picket line and protest, which I will continue to do, I love it, um, but also participate in governance and, you know, uh, design ways that we can, you know, create systems and create institutions uh, that are just and fair and compassionate. I'm very grateful to get the opportunity to represent my state in a progressive way, um, but I want to let folks know that this is only the beginning. For now, Rosemary says that she's focused on local politics, but doesn't rule out a run for higher office down the road. And she hopes her story will inspire others to get involved in their local governments, too.